this is something that's not a problem just for uh, women of color that are in poverty, right? Because we see Serena Williams, um, Judge Hatch's daughter, having problems advocating for themselves. Um, most recently, this is not in, in childbirth, but the doctor who died um, of COVID while she was in the hospital, well, a woman of color not being listened to. If a you know white man says that he, his pain level is 10 on the pain scale, he is believed because there's no reason, again, to not believe that this person is, is saying how their pain is being received. But a woman of color um, and these generational reasons for not trusting healthcare professionals, we have so many different barriers and layers that are on top of reaching um, healthcare. Think about how gynecology was even started and how we they had those advances in gynecology with practicing and doing experiments on Black women. So it's hard to trust a system that has um, consistently shown you that it's not made for you. So then we have more issues with reaching care. You, you're pregnant or you need care and you don't, don't trust the system. So why would I go, you know, to the hospital or what will happen? You know, again, with mental health issues, if they're having some sort of issues outside of, you know, the maternity care issues that are going on, are they going to take my child from me? Is my child going to be a part of the system? Yeah. There's just so many different layers that come into play when it comes down to uh, reaching out for access to care, you know, I, we, we all have some level of privilege when it comes down to reaching for care, you know, I don't have to worry about do I have health insurance? Yes, I have, you know, a, a, a job and I'm able to pay for certain things and I don't have to worry about that. But once we come into a system where we take it on again, I'm going to reiterate over and over and over again that this is a we problem. I should be just as concerned about health care for minorities as the next person, even though I am a minority, the, the white women in the room, the Hispanic women, everybody, the, the white male who's created the system. The APA's apology is so huge because of how big the APA is. And they're saying, oh, we did make a mistake. That is huge. And that is for CEOs, anybody in business to take a look at and be like, but if the APA, who is this huge, made a mistake and let this system build upon itself, creating these barriers, and we, we've just allowed it to happen, I might be a part of that problem as well. You know, I'm not exempt from that. So again, the maternal death rate for people of color is is still climbing when we have so many advances. So you have to take a look at what's going on around us and those, those structural racism and the barriers and all those things that are playing into that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Ms. Elliott, uh, would you mind commenting on, on that or do you have anything that you would like to Oh, I'd be most pleased to comment on that because we've got, we've got to start say, stop saying it's because of the parents. Parents do not get paid for educating children. They send them to us with the hope that we're going to spend eight hours a day, six to eight hours a day, truly educating their child. Education is the way up for all children, but particularly for children of color. So you cannot be blaming the parents if, they, if those kids aren't getting educated. Teachers, educators are paid to do that job. Damn it, we've got to get busy and do it. Stop blaming mothers. Mm. Mothers raise these kids and send them to you and they expect you to do your job. And whether or not they have done their job the way you want them to do it, the fact of the matter is they don't get paid for that job. Teachers get paid for doing that job and they better get busy and do it. We've got to watch out for the word privilege. Mm. Have you read the list of white privileges? If you haven't read the list of white privileges, look at it. Get it on your computer right now, white privileges, and look at that list. And that is being used throughout the United States to decide how people should or should not be treated. Listen, let me just, do I have time to read a couple of these to you? Yes, please, please. Because I think everybody needs to be aware of where that white privileges business came from. It is mm -hmm. one of, in my estimation, one of the most destructive things that I have ever seen. The woman who wrote this, and she's a lovely lady, and I've been to a white privileges conference, but she says things like, I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race 
my race being widely represented at practically every one of these, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. I can be pretty sure of having my race, my race, my race. Now, she wrote this in 1987. At that time, evidently, she didn't realize that there's only one race. But if she has all these privileges because of her race, since we're all members of the same race, we should all have these same privileges. Unfortunately, we don't all have these same privileges because some of us have the privileges, but they shouldn't be called privileges. They should be called unearned advantages. And it shouldn't be termed white privilege because there are no white people. It should be called melanemic unearned advantages. We've got to do away with the idea that these things that we have are privileges because we are the right color. It's wrong. It was wrong in 1987 and it's wrong today. We need to stop talking about privilege as if, well, I have the rights to these because I have the bright color skin. The first modern human beings that evolved on this earth look more like you than they look like me. And kids have to be taught that and have to realize that we are all members of the race of people who evolved on this earth looking like you, not like me. And that all these differences as far as our skin color, our hair color, and our eye color, and the shape of our bones, and our height, and our weight, are all our reactions to the natural environment. They are not because we are God's chosen children, or because our parents were good parents. We have to stop blaming this on parents, and stop thinking about, well, if you, <laughs> the biggest crime a child can commit is being born black, and I want that stopped. I want you, all of us, all of us to realize that we're shades of brown and we'd better get used to it because within 30 years, melanemic people will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. Within 30 years, melanemic people, white people, will be a minority, numerical minority group in this country. We had better start learning how to appreciate those who are different from ourselves and better start learning how it feels to be regarded as we have regarded other people. We had better, and one of the major fears of Melanie white people is, if people who look like you get power, they're going to treat us the way we have treated them. And that is the major fear that expressed is expressed to me every time I do a, a program. Some woman will stand up and say, well, if those people get power, aren't they gonna wanna treat us the way we've treated them? Somebody asked me, and, and Angela Davis was on the stage with me, and up to that point, she was been kind of looking at me like, well, I wonder what this one has. And I said, okay, now let me, and this woman said, I think, and I said, okay, let's find out if you're right about that. And there are 1,500 students in that auditorium, half of them were black. I said, well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the black race and who wants to get even with all white folks, please stand. Three young black males stood. And the rest of them just looked at him like, are you crazy? And I said, see, they don't want to get rid of even with all of us. Now are you more comfortable? She said, well, I think so. I said, well, I'm glad. Now let's be honest about it. Well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the black race and wants to get even with one or two white people, please stand. Every one of them leaped to their feet, clapping and cheering and high-fiving one another and just delighted. I said, are you comfortable now? She said, well, no, I'm not. I said, in other words, you, you think you're one of the one or two they're gonna to wanna to get even with. Let me tell you how to deal with that. If you want to be treated fairly in the future, treat other people fairly in the present. Behave in such a way that you aren't one of the one or two they wanna get even with. Does that make sense to you? And she said, well, I think so. And I said to the audience, does that make sense to you? And they all cheered and laughed and high-fived one another again. All people want, I think, is to be treated equally under the law. Is that too much to ask? And if it is too much to ask, then we need to change the system. Treat, don't, pe don't treat people the way you want to be treated. No, by God, I don't believe in the golden rule. I don't believe that every person wants to be treated the way I want to be treated. I believe in the platinum rule that says, treat others the way they want to be treated. And in order for me to find out how you want to be treated, I can't walk up to you and say, how do black people want to be treated? I have to go to the library, get books written by people of different cultures and read them and find out how people want to be treated. And then I'll know enough not to mistreat others. 
I do not believe in the golden rule as it was written. But you see, originally it came out of, I believe, Chinese philosophy. And it didn't say do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It said do unto others as others would have you do unto them. When I get on an airplane and I have a piece of luggage to put in the overhead rack, if some young man says to me, can I put up that, put that up for you, ma'am? I say, thank you very much. You must have good parents. If I get on a plane and I say to a young man, can I put that piece of luggage up for you? He'll say, no, thank you. I can handle this myself. We don't all want to be treated the same. And we don't have the right to, to decide how people want to be treated because of how we want to be treated. It doesn't work, particularly. You find that out as you get to be my age. You find out that you don't want to be treated the way young people are treated. So I've done it again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. And that is actually a great segue into my next question regarding treating people and the experience that you have in this time of your life. This question I want to pose for every panelist. What social and or environmental constructs based on the old guard of racism that has cascaded throughout various industries, education, medical, clinical, of those various industries that transcended time and that are hidden in plain sight, but not easily identified by the millennial generation. What are those old guards? Those old guards of racism that the new millennial or the generation X, generation Y, Generation Z may not be able to identify, but they're hidden in plain sight. All you have to do is be a black man driving down the road in a fancy car. Mm -hmm. And you'll get picked up. You'll get picked up every 15 minutes or every half hour, every two hours. All you have to be is a person of color who looks like he has something that he shouldn't have. And you will get picked up and you will be told to assume the position and you will have to show your identification and your parents will have told you, particularly your father would have told you, now here's the way you behave when that happens. Keep your mouth shut, say yes, sir, no, so don't, do not put your hands in your pocket and show respect. Do not react negatively. I never had to say that to my sons. But if you're black, you have to say that to your children. And the same thing is true, the same thing is true for people of color who look like they're in the wrong place. All you have to do is be walking in the wrong neighborhood. All you have to do is be a black man who's a meter reader. Mm. And somebody who is new to that neighborhood and it's a nice neighborhood will call the police because there's a black man walking across their lawn. It happens almost on a daily basis because we are allowed to think of people who belong in this situation or in this place or in this position and those who don't. Honestly, it's, it's it happens constantly. I've done it myself. Mm. We, need to, we need to be aware that we're doing it. No, we, we have a phrase for that in psychology and psychiatry. We call it unconscious bias. People, unconscious bias is a fancy polysyllabic term for ignorance and for not having to be aware of who we are, where we are, what we are, and what we are thinking. I don't think, I, I don't think, see, I have a hard time making up all these lovely long-winded words to describe and to explain and to forgive the ugly behaviors that we exhibit on a daily basis where people who are different from ourselves are. Mm. All we have to do is come up with another new term for it, and we're doing it all the time. Wow. It's, time to, it's time to start telling the truth, plain, simple truth. Mm. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. And Mr. Avery, I wanted to ask you because I know that, you know, being a an African American man, are there any young males that are of the BIPOC community who you feel may not be aware of the racism that reverberates even to today that you may have experienced? Where as Ms. Elliott talked about you know, she never had to actually talk to her son about, as we call it in the black family, the talk. Absolutely. I have a 12 year old son um, who thinks highly of everybody. And it's important for me as his father to educate him on the ugliness of the world that he lives in. Mm. Right. Obviously, I don't want to tanked his heart um, to cause him to feel that uh, 
everyone that looks like him doesn't love him or like him. But it's also important for me that as a as as a as a black father to be open and honest with him about the ugly truth. Um, it's important for me to teach my son about microaggressions. Uh, I remember my son telling me at one point, the teacher saying that he was the smartest. Uh, you're really smart for a black kid. Uh huh. Seeing it as a for him, seeing it as a compliment. For me, it it. Excuse my French, but it pissed me off. And he didn't understand why. And it was important for me to educate him on microaggression and what exactly that teacher was saying. Right? What she was saying was Black students aren't typically smart. You're the exception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And help him understand that. I see that a lot with working with teens and working with kids, right? I specialize in child and adolescent therapy and I see a lot of black kids, right? Some of the things that they feel like may be cool that I see and help them understand that those are truly microaggressions, right? This isn't meant to be a compliment. This is meant to insult you, right? To belittle you, right? And it's, simply racist and that makes it a macroaggression there exactly. are no microaggressions there are mm -hmm. we get away with saying we shouldn't things saying we things we shouldn't say and we use big words to explain them and to to not forgive them but just to explain our ignorance microaggressions as far as i'm concerned don't exist when that kid comes home and says to you the teacher says i'm doing real well for a black kid you need to go to the school and say, let me tell you something about this. I'm going to expect you before you come back to school tomorrow, Ms. Whoever you are, to read this book and give her a copy of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization and say to her, I expect you never, never to say to my, uh, this child or any other child, you do real well for a black person. I need you to know this much if you're going to teach my child you need to know more than you knew yesterday when you made that statement to my child. Trust me, my wife and I don't stand for that. So the teacher did get a but, she did get an earful. But you see, a lot of parents do stand for that. And a lot of parents live down to people's expectations of them and think the teachers know everything. And so they let these things happen to their kids. And then kids begin to live down to the teacher's expectations instead of what they really are capable of doing. Teacher expectations are one of the most effective means of keeping people down or bringing people up. Believe me, I've watched this happen. I've watched kids who couldn't learn, learn from teachers who said, I expect you to learn and I know you can. But if you're doing pretty well for a black child, that tells me what she thinks of every child in that classroom and how she classes them depending on her ignorance, not on their skin color. This is not a matter of skin color. This is a matter of ignorance about skin color. This is a matter of educator ignorance. And thank you so yeah. much for that for that insight and that dialogue. Lakeisha, I wanted to, to um, shift the question to you <laughs> and get your input on your thoughts as a diversity, yeah. equity and inclusion consultant. What have been some of the issues that are themed around the DEI that you actually have consulted with some of your clients? What has been the main theme of problems and challenges? Yeah, so the biggest concern, and, and again, to answer coming, the generations that are now entering the workforce, right? We, we've prided ourselves on teaching our children individuality and to embrace those things that are different from them, wear your hair, the way it naturally grows from your head and you should be accepted as you are. However, uh, in corporate America and in business, as we get into these organizations, uh, that's not welcoming, right? You don't belong here. And we hear that language, uh, not a good culture fit, um, all of these different terms that mean uh, we don't like the way you look for some reason. You don't look like we think you should look at, so you don't belong here. So a lot of the programming and things that they want to create are for optics. You know, it's, it's to check that box. Diversity means you have a number of people of a certain category and you have, of course, achieved diversity and able to check that box. 
However, what are you doing to keep these people? Is there succession planning? If I come into your organization, is there a way for me to reach it to the, to the top and not only have a seat at that table, but a voice while I'm there? Um, what does the mentorship programs look like? The, is there someone that looks like me there to mentor me to get to those high level of positions? You know, we still live in the land where boards are, are white male and there's no diversity of thought. You know, the, all of these things, building that business case for diversity is easy. You know, we, we have the data that says innovation comes from diversity, um, new ideas, uh, you get out of group think when you have diversity, people outside of, you know, everybody thinking the same on these boards, they're coming up with the same ideas over and over again and creating the same policies and programs um, that are not, don't have action steps that really create spaces and places of belonging. And that is the real outcome of what we're trying to create here, not just to create diverse um, organizations where when you get to a certain level, there, there's no way for you to break those barriers. It, you know, it's 2021, we're still having the first this, the first that. Um, so that lets you know that while we are making progress, like we said, this APA apology is huge in the direction of progress, but how do we continue this conversation, continue to create those spaces? You know, I have a 23 year old son who is just graduating from college and entering in the workforce. And, and my concern for him is way different. You know, he's excited to go to work and, you know, he's got his little desk and his cubicle and all of these things, but knowing where he works, um, I, I'm worried like he's going to reach that barrier being an African-American man with his Afro, you know, where he'll have to, uh, if we don't continue to make this progress, assimilate in order to fit in and seem less threatening and less of a threat. What does that mean? Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. And I wanted to also include, um, before we close out this topic, um, dealing with the medical as well as the entertainment, how does primarily the entertainment business play a role in the influence of those who are spectators or the audience who sees the, the disparities on television, who reads about it in the newspaper, who actually sees it in, in every way they turn based on every medium from audio to visual to print. How does the media play a part in helping or hurting the cause to bring more diversity and inclusion, as well as combating racism. Miss Elliot, if you will, please. <laughs> we teach racism mm -hmm. by what we watch on television. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to what Marshall McLuhan said. And if you don't know who Marshall McLuhan was, get a Marshall McLuhan book. And he said, stay away from television. It will ruin your children's minds. We have a whole mess of children now and, and adults today who are screen addicted. If it isn't happening, if it hasn't, if they haven't seen it on television, they don't believe it. Mm. They want to be on in front of that camera. That's what they want. Kids do not understand what it is like to be an adult because you are in this country today encouraged to maintain your child ego state or your parent ego state. We see too few people getting into their adult ego state. And we have had really an ugly example of that for the last four years in the leader of this country. That man is a, was a case, is a case of interrupted, <laughs> what am I saying? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right now, I'm, I'm just so angry right now because mm -hmm. we're talking about things like, what do we do to change this situation? You have to realize that we are being led down the wrong path by television. And by the kind we put kids in front of video games and teach them how to kill. And the one who wins the best game, who wins the game is the one who kills the best, the fastest, and kills the most. And then we start a war and send them to kill people because we've already trained them how to do it. We are doing the wrong, we are training in the wrong areas in this kid in this country where television is concerned and where video games are concerned. For the love of heaven, there must be something better to do in this world than sit in front of that television and play those games that kids don't learn a whole lot from, mm. except how to succeed. It used to be how to succeed in business by really trying. 
Now it's how to succeed in this game by being the best killer. Everybody needs to read Whitney Young's book, Beyond Racism. It's an old book and he wrote it, I think in the late fifties, maybe early sixties. He says, and one of the things I'll never forget in that book, he says, every employer who's, who's in charge of employing people has to have a sign on his desk that says hire black. He says, and don't just hire the smartest and the most beautiful. I see dumb white people getting jobs all the time. That stuck in my mind the first time I read it. And I thought, oh, good Lord, of course he's right. But all you have to be in this country, if you want to be successful, is a white male. It doesn't matter whether you know anything. You don't have to be anything as long as you have the right coloration and the white gender. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm watch, I've watched it for too long. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Elliott. Yes. And I want to pose a question as well to Mr. Avery. I know Miss Elliott touched on the video games and we, you know, addressed social media as well as the media as a whole. What plans or what strategies or modalities do you put in place when you have your clients who are young and adolescent and they are oversaturated with social media and the video games that actually creates inceptions about violence. What strategies do you put in place in regards to boundaries or things that you talk to them about? Oftentimes I like to start with the parents um, and getting a gauge of what they allow their kids to watch, right? Um, and understanding how certain behaviors are indicative of what they're watching, right? So a lot of the strategies that I like to try to get my students to watch or to, to engage in is things that take them away from the TV that, that will require them to use uh, their analytical skills or their ability to read and to comprehend by assigning them books to read, things to do outdoors, right? Um, if they are gun ho about watching certain things, then I like to... Um, use different forms of, of music as a way of reaching and teaching, right? Um, I sometimes, depending on the, depending on the music, uh, the message that it is betraying uh, goes hand in hand with the behaviors that they're displaying, right? So a lot of the things that I like to do is, okay, if this is something, if, if music is something that you're into, let me introduce you to a musician, right, that talks about the things that are happening in the world, a more conscious type of rap or or music or forms of entertainment that 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 don't just perpetuate this stigma that suggests that black people are this this dead in a third, right? But but inspires and uplifts and educates, right? Uh, the masses. So those are some of the things that I try to do. I don't often try to sway them away from watching uh, watching TV or or listening to certain music or listening to music. However, I try to introduce them to other forms of entertainment that are more so uh, woke, quote unquote. Thank you. And Ms. Lakeisha, I would like to ask you, because I know you're a consultant and specialist and workshop leader on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, what do you see that is the theme or the trend in social media as well as the media in regards to what they project to us throughout screens and print and audio? Um, I see a lot with, while they, there's a call for change and there's all of this um, activism out on social media and in the, in the media as well, uh, but people not wanting to take that next level step and taking it, taking ownership, right? So having, being able to share a message, chain your screen to Black, for Black Lives Matter, or to have these different calls of action without actually taking action is, is a lot of what I see. And again, with those broken programs that are created, it's, it's for optics, it's not real, and that's why the wheels are continuously spinning because you haven't done that deep work and that education that um, comes with relearning everything. You know, black and brown history is not taught in schools. And so you have this image of what it means to be black or brown in the world. And 
you continue on with that messaging by not actually taking it, taking ownership of the problem. Thank you, thank you. And now what I would like to do, because I know that time is winding to a close, um, I would like to go to the question and answer and read a few questions that some of the audience may have for the panel. Uh, my first, first question that I would like to go to, it is from Miss Bernie. Bernie, it says, how is ignorance tied to racism? Considering those who call themselves white created racism, is it more accurate to state that historical knowledge of how to treat victims of racism has been used to maintain racism? I know that was a mouthful with that question. I can repeat if I need to. So I'll just read the question in incremental statements. How, how is ignorance tied to racism considering those who call themselves white created racism? Well, if they call themselves white, they're ignorant in the first place. Mm. If they really do think they're white, they haven't looked in the mirror lately. They need mm. to look, they need to get a copy of the Pantone color wheel. They need to hang it on their wall and then they need to put their hand up against it and see if they can find their color, their skin color on the Pantone color wheel. Then maybe they'd stop calling themselves white because they aren't white. I'm not white. My shirt is white. My hair is white. My skin is not and never has been. We are ignorant as long as we refer to people as white and black. That in itself is an indication of cultural ignorance and we need to get rid of it. Thank you, thank you. Avery, Lakeisha, is there any insight or feedback? Okay, so I also have a question from Melissa. Her question is, is there any language patients can use with their practitioners on becoming better informed on these issues without risk of being further stigmatized or labeled as a problem patient? I think I'll take this one um, because the stigma of <laughs> speaking up, you know, is real, right? How do I say, advocate for myself without further damaging myself in the, in the process? Um, and the, the key to that is what I call um, cultural safety. And that's mm -hmm. where practitioners are going to need to re-educate themselves as well on, again, the systematic racism that the APA, the AMA, all of these organizations have allowed to come in and reprogram them, them, themselves on listening to people of different backgrounds that don't come from the same background as they do. Um, so yeah, cultural safety is, is a real thing. Cultural competencies in practice in the, the therapy room as well as in hospital rooms and interacting with patients um, saying, hey, I, I'm not comfortable with where this is going. Can I have someone else in the room to advocate with and for me, um, knowing where to go to get those services and, and referring out if necessary. But the key is again, practitioners and doctors and nurses and all of them need that uh, re-education and cultural competencies and cultural safety to keep everyone safe. Great, thank you. Mr. Avery, I'll, I saw I'll that you- that. Yeah, yes. don't allow your voice to be stifled out of fear. If you feel like your voice isn't being heard and you can't be your authentic self to your provider that you are paying, find someone else that will listen. Right, right. Right, right. The, the common misconception is that you don't see a lot of that uh, there aren't black therapists or African-American therapists, male or female, we're here, mm. all right? We're here. Go to where you, I always tell people to go and I tell my son this, go where you're celebrated and not where you're tolerated. Mm. If you feel like you gotta go to a place and you have, you're, you're being tolerated by, and you feel like you have to stifle your voice out of fear of, being you know misdiagnosed and treated a certain way go where you're taught go where you're celebrated it's okay to leave you're not for me right you may be a good therapist or a good practitioner but you're just not good for me and that's okay right but also to Lakeisha's point absolutely yes cultural competency from a clinician it has to be something that the clinician feels strongly about mm -hmm. right they have to feel it within their heart to say dang i need to re-educate myself Right. I've been implicit in this racism, right, as it relates to the treatment of black and brown people. I need to do some heart to heart with self 
and 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 be willing to to educate myself. I've seen plenty of clinicians uh, that that weren't willing, but I've also seen a lot of other clinicians that have stood in an uncomfortable position and asked questions to a room full of people that didn't look like them, mm-hmm. right? Because they wanted to understand. Yes. Yes. Right. But don't let don't allow your voice be stifled by fear. Go to where you're celebrating, not where you're tolerating. Great. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for that feedback. And I'll take this last question before we close out. Um, And before that, I will also post your contact information to social media. So audience, if you're looking and you would like to get in contact or make purchases or support the panel, um, I will leave the contact information, websites and handles at the end of this virtual event. The last question for tonight from the audience states, what actions, and this is from Mr. Cordell, what actions can be made in public education system to get more information on books to change our youth's views on racism? Do you want me to answer that? Yes, please. (laughs) All right. The first thing you have to do is realize that you are being miseducated on a daily basis by using things like the maps. Get Get a look at this map. This is the Mercator projection map. You see the size of Greenland on this map? You see the size of South America and the size of, of, of Africa people. Mm. This map is being used throughout the schools in the United States of America to teach about the size, the shape, and the location of the land masses on the face of the earth. Now, this is just one thing you can do. It's a cheap thing to do. Get a copy of a better map. Greenland is not bigger than South America and Africa. And at the bottom of most of these Mercator maps, it says South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Now that's what it says at the bottom of the map, but this is what it shows on the map. This is one of the things you can do. There is a better way to see the world. And here's the Peters projection map. Now I know this sounds like a simple minded thing to do, but when you're showing children the wrong size, shape and location of the land masses on the face of the earth and pretending that only the people in this Northern hemisphere have done good things, you need to have your children see this map. This is the Peters projection map. You get it from odtmaps.com. Your kids have a right to see a better idea of what the world, what the, the land masses on the earth look like. And they also have the right to see the map that's in the National Geographic magazine for April of 2018. And if you haven't seen this, get it and copy this map, enlarge it, and then hang it on every wall, every wall that you can find. This is where human beings began. And those brilliant dark-skinned people managed to move across the earth and populate every landmass on the face of the earth without any modern technology. How in the devil did they do that if they weren't brilliant? And they did it. And they are my forefathers and your forefathers. We are all 30th to 50th cousins of the people who did that. We've got to start talking about the fantastic things that people of color have done over the ages instead of pretending that we got the people of color came to this country as slaves. We did, they did not come to this country first as slaves. They came as adventurers and explorers. And you need to know this, your children need to know this. And so do your adults need to know this. And I don't think most of us do. Wow, wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Are there any other thoughts, comments? Did we miss any insight or feedback or anyone have any? open discussion that they would like to insert at this time from the panel. I would just like if Miss Elliot, if you could just repeat some of the books that you said for people (laughs) to read because they were also always trying to jot them down so quickly as you were speaking, but uh, if you could just repeat some of the books that you suggested that we all take a look at. Anthony Browder's Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Robert Wall Sussman's The Myth of Race. Robert, um, Whitney Young's Beyond Racism. It'll be hard to find it, but find it because it's worth your time to find that book and read it. Oh, everybody, everybody on the face of the earth has to read, just a minute now, Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny. It's about this thick and you can read it in an hour and you will 20 lessons from the 20th century. Everybody has to read that and then read and then read Timothy 
Snyder's book, The Road to, On the Road to Unfreedom, which is where we are. And you have to read, oh, the, uh, that, give me a minute. Well, you'll probably have to give me half an hour, but at least read that, that group and then go to my website, jane at janeelliot.com and download the printed learning materials that you'll find there. The first is a set of typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist and you've all heard every one of them. Go through that list of typical statements, check yes, those that you agree with, and then look at the clarifications of those statements, how they are perceived by the people who are on the receiving end of them. And then, the, then you'll find out that here's a bunch of typical statements that you better not make white folks. They need that education. Then there is a set of commitments to combat racism. Everybody should go through those commitments to combat racism. Check those that you have done, yes. Check those that you haven't done, no. Check, then circle one that you check, no. Put the date beside it and go back and decide to do it for a month. Then at the end of the month, go back, look at what you learned, write down what you learned and choose another one. And now people are saying, well, racism is a societal problem. Societies are made up of individuals. And if we can get individuals to change their behaviors, we can change the level of racism in this society. There is not a doubt in my mind, but what we can. And get the film, The Eye of the Storm, and realize that all those kids came into my class reading at first or low first grade level and left reading from the fourth to the sixth grade level nine months later. Children will live down to their teachers' expectations of them. So you have to expect more of teachers than teachers want to expect of their students. Get that film and take a look at it and then have a discussion with people about what happened. Is that the way it feels to be black in this country on a daily basis? And if it is, how in the devil do we expect people of color to trust us? Just take a look at that film. It, and it's not because I'm in it, it's because there's some good stuff in it, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Elliot, for the wealth and enrichment of information that you provided. Are there any closing thoughts from Mr. Avery, Ms. Lakeisha, before we conclude? Just thank you so much for creating this space for all of us to, to engage. So thank you for putting this panel together and having, having me here. Wow. I, I echo what Lakeisha stated. Thank you so much for, for assembling such a wonderful uh, group of individuals um, to discuss such an important topic. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Wow. Thank you. And so with that in mind, I would like to give my gratitude to you, Mr. Avery, to you, Ms. Lakeisha, and also to Ms. Jane Elliott for taking the time out to be with us and to share the wealth of knowledge, experience, and the expertise from your perspectives and vantage points. And I definitely look forward to keeping in contact and for further events that are down the road. And to the audience, thank you for sticking with us. And thank you for being receptive to the information that has been provided to you from the panel and from their thoughts and their experience. And that will be it. And this is going to conclude the event which is Walls of Racism, the addressing of support system of racism for this event. And so with that being said, I'm going to leave your information up. And again, thank you. Have a great evening. And I look forward to more discussions in the future. Have a great night. Are we done? Okay. Yes. Thank you.